Greetings to uh, Mount Carmel Church family and friends that are joining us by Facebook and YouTube. We have made a point to have Bible study on Wednesday evenings for the last several weeks and trust that this will help uh, in your stay at home time and also gives us some continuity in the midst of a difficult situation. We are recording our uh, Bible studies from locations outside of the church. And tonight we are at uh, Ritchie Lake. Uh, this place has a special meaning for the Mount Carmel Church family for the last several years we've had our baptismal services here and when I give people the choice of being baptized in a baptist in the church which we would have to go to another church or waiting and being baptized in the lake I honestly cannot tell you the last one that ever said they would like to be baptized in a church everybody uh, immediately says they want to come to the lake and it's just a beautiful place and we just appreciate the Ritchie family for allowing us the use of the facilities and when we started thinking about locations away from the church building we just want to give you a, a picture of God's greatness and God's power and pray that as we go through these studies uh, it will help you to strengthen your faith and just to be at peace in the Lord. Last week we were looking at the study of Abraham and the life of Abraham in the scriptures at least covers quite a few chapters and his life covered quite a few years, about 125 to be exact. And when we came to the close of our service we were talking about Abraham wanting to make sure that uh, his son Isaac was uh, going to get a wife from one of the hometown girls. And he said, I don't want him marrying somebody from a foreign country. And so he gave his, his servants instructions and off he went. And sure enough, the Lord directed him to a beautiful young girl by the name of Rebecca and she would become Isaac's wife. It was time I really thought that our study tonight was going to be on the life of Jacob, but I realized that Abraham and Jacob were kind of bookends and Isaac just seemed to get lost in the middle. And truth is, uh, the scripture about Isaac doesn't really cover uh, very much space, but what it does say about him I think is important to us and he was certainly one of the uh, forefathers and always listed as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the three of them again were like links in the chain. And so tonight I want to read to you from Genesis chapter 26 and I will read verse 24 and 25. The Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there, and called upon the name of the Lord, and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants digged a well. When the chapter begins, Isaac is in a place called Gerar, and a famine has hit the land. And this is not the same famine that took place uh, in the life of Abraham. And human nature being what it is, when famine strikes, the natural tendency is go somewhere where there is plenty of food. And Certainly, Isaac would have been tempted to do that. But the Lord told him, don't go. Don't go to Egypt. Stay in Gerar. And said, if you'll do that, I will bless you. And so 
that is precisely what happened. The interesting thing is, like father, like son, if you recall last week we said that Abraham lied twice about his wife Sarah and told her to say to the people of the countries that they were visiting that you're my sister. And it could have been uh, severe consequences for those nations had they violated uh, Sarah. And wouldn't you know it, Isaac turns around and does the same thing. He tells Sarah that I want you to tell the Philistines that you are my sister. And they would later, again, the same man, Abimelech, was the one who confronted Abraham. He's the one that's going to confront Isaac about telling really a basic lie. And so Isaac does what the Lord tells him to do. And the Lord does what he told Isaac he would do. He blessed Isaac. His crops brought forth a hundred times in return. Let me tell you, any farmer would be glad to have that kind of return on his investment, on his crops. And so things are going good, real good for Isaac. And sometimes that's not always a good sign because you know that the devil is going to be working, always has, and always will be. And so the big issue of that time, you come to realize this as you study the scripture, regardless of where it is in the Old Testament, one of the very important things, one of the very important assets that anybody could have during that time was a well. The Bible has a lot to say about wells. And we know that Jacob's well was, and still is, one of the most familiar in the scripture. Well, Abraham servants had dug some wells. And no doubt out of jealousy for Isaac, the Philistines fill those wells in with dirt. And so in the course of that, the scripture says that Abimelech told Isaac, why don't you just go somewhere else? Uh, you are too rich, you are too powerful, and isn't it interesting how the unsaved people, the ungodly people, the people of the world, recognize the goodness of the Lord in the people of the Lord? And so Isaac did exactly what he had originally intended to do. He went down to the valley of Gerar, and the scripture says there he dug some new wells, or at least his servants did. And I'm guessing by the time all of this is over, they're going to wish they'd never heard the word well because they dug a well and the people of the land came and took it over. They had a dispute. They said, that's ours. But how can you say it's ours when you had nothing to do with digging it? But it's interesting because Isaac named each one of the wells they dug. The first one they dug, and the enemies decided they wanted to lay claim to it, he named it Esek, and it means the well of argument, and that's really what it was. They had an argument over who that well belonged to. Then Isaac, being the godly man that he was, and not to one to want confrontation, said, fine with that, we'll just go dig another well. That's precisely what they did. And needless to say, they had not much more and gotten that well dug before the inhabitants of the land said, hey, that's our well, uh, we're taking that. And Isaac named that well Sitna, which means the well of anger. And so, you see how a pattern developing here? The well of argument, the well of anger. And so, again, Isaac being the gracious man of God that he was, 
said, fine, you want it, you have it. We'll go dig another one. And that's exactly what he did. Remember I said the servants are probably wishing by now they'd never heard of a will. And so Isaac has his servants to dig another one. They aren't challenged about this one. And he calls the name of that third well Rehoboth, which means the well of room enough. Because by this time, Isaac had come to realize if he was just obedient to God, if he just avoided confrontation at all costs, then God would honor him and God would bless him. And so when he named that third well Rehoboth, he was essentially saying, there's room enough here for all of us. And it was basically what Abraham told Lot. Uh, you go to the right, I'll go to the left. You go to the left, I'll go to the right. You take what you want, I'll take what's left. And so sometimes it's not always easy, but if there, it, Isaac can teach us anything, it is that a gracious spirit goes a long way and a confrontational spirit accomplishes very little in the long run. And the person who will demonstrate that gracious spirit will find out that God will honor that, God will bless them for that. And so he calls the name of the area where he goes from there, Beersheba. And it was, again, a place that reflected the goodness of the Lord because Beersheba means the Lord has made room for us. And he also knew that as long as he was obedient to the Lord, we're going to thrive. And that is precisely what we did. When Isaac got to Beersheba, wouldn't you know, he gets a visit from Abimelech. Well, if you recall, Abimelech was the one who told Isaac, you're too rich, you're too powerful, you need to leave here. And so, in due time, he makes the journey to Beersheba and has a conversation with Isaac. But Isaac has the first words, and he basically said, what are you doing down here? Why do you want to see me? If I remember correctly, you didn't exactly give us a going away party uh, when you asked us to leave town. And you really didn't say that as an option. It pretty much was a mandate. So what do you want? What's your purpose in being here? And Abimelech said, I know, and I've been watching, God has blessed you. The Lord has blessed you beyond anything anybody could compare. And he said, if you do remember, when we lived in the same area, I didn't really cause any problems with you. I didn't have any issues, we didn't go to battle, anything like that. I just politely asked you to leave because I recognize God's goodness and God's greatness. As far as I was concerned, you were too rich and you were too powerful. And I was concerned that in due time, you would be a threat to us. Again, Isaac being the gracious man that he was, said, why don't you stay overnight? Why don't we have a feast? And why don't we make an oath? And that is precisely what happened. And out of that, for all intents and purposes, Abimelech signed a peace treaty. We don't know a lot about Isaac. We'll talk more about him later uh, when he gets into the matter with his sons. But this is about the extent of what we know about Isaac. But what we do know was 
he demonstrated godlike character in everything that he did. He was obedient to the Lord when he told him to stay in Gerar. He was obedient when he found out that he needed to leave in order to avoid strife with the Philistines. He was gracious when he dug a well and his enemy came along and took possession of it. He dug a second well, they did the same thing. He dug a third well. And by this time, I guess Isaac feel like love will always win no matter what. Love never fails. And that's exactly what Isaac did. That's the spirit that he had. And everything that you read about Isaac, while it might not be lengthy as far as chapters and verses, it says a whole lot in a few short verses. And that is simply this, that the man of God, who will be obedient to God and demonstrate godlike character, will always come out on the winning side. There may be times when it doesn't seem that way. I'm sure when they filled in those first two well, the first well, and then they took possession of the next two, by this time, Isaac's got to be thinking, what's the use? This is the lost cause. But he just kept on loving, being gracious, being obedient, and in due time, God honored it, and Isaac never doubted that he would do that right from the start. And so my invitation to you tonight is when things are not well, when things are difficult in your life, keep on trusting, keep on believing, keep on obeying, and at some point you will find out that it was the right choice. You know it is, but at some point, God will verify that. He will underscore that. And you will know that looking back, you'll be amused at how God worked it all together, even through the difficult and trying time. And so I pray that Isaac's life would be an incentive and an encouragement to you, and you will just continue to follow the Lord. And if you do that, you will always come out a winner. I pray tonight that if you've never invited Christ into your heart, you will do that. I pray that you are planning to join us for our worship service Sunday morning uh, that will be again aired on uh, Facebook and YouTube. And once again, thank you for your comments. Thank you for uh, your response to our services and please feel free to share with us any suggestion that you have we're trying to work it to the best of our ability to make sure that we bring you the most meaningful worship service we can under the circumstances that we now have bow with me as we pray father thank you tonight in jesus name lord we thank you for this beautiful location this is just a part, a small part of the great world that you have created. And when we look behind us and we see this beautiful lake, we are reminded of the times that our Lord crossed that Sea of Galilee with his disciples, realizing that in the process they encountered storms. But we never forget their fear how terrified they were, but neither can we forget the calming, reassuring words of our Lord, peace be still. He speaks those words tonight. We thank you, Father, that your word still calms the storms in our life and gives us the assurance that Jesus is still in control and God is still on his throne. In his name we pray, amen. Let Paul give you a picture of the surroundings, if you would like.
and this is I think I have been told a 45 acre lake but it's just a demonstration of God's greatness and God's power enjoy the view